So a bit of real talk here, Arouge is actually one of my least favorite members of the worst generation, and it's not because of his design, his power, or even his minimal role in the story thus far. It's all because every now and then that sneaky, sneaky monk strolls onto YouTube and steals my subscribe button, thus preventing you all from pressing it to receive regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. So while it is still very briefly here, I recommend you press it before this smiling demon thieves it once again. I got beat up quite badly, but I'll see whether or not there's still hope for me. As I return the attack, I'll have to thank you for inflicting these wounds upon me. Now prepare yourself for karmic punishment. Hello and welcome to One Piece 101, the series that breaks down everyone and everything in the One Piece world. And today, we're going to be looking into one of the most mysterious members of the worst generation, being the ever smiley Mad Monk Rouge. Rouge is a bulky and towering presence who may even be best physically described as just as wide as he is tall. With that said, Rouge's most distinguishing feature would be his everlasting smile, which is almost always being worn, no matter how awful a situation he may be in. And you also may have noticed by this point that Rouge sports a pair of wings, making him a denizen of the sky. And although this is currently unconfirmed, it is hinted that he was from the sky island of Burka, which is notable for being the location where Enel was born and would eventually come to destroy. And this thought prevails because Rouge's wings tend to to match those of the Birkin forces that Enel brought with him. However, it should also be stated that Arouge was drawn as a child by Oda in the SBS of Volume 64, which depicted him with both the wings and hairstyle of the Skypean people. And rather sadly, that image is pretty much the extent of what we know of the early days of Arouge. But at some point, he would make his way down to the Blue Sea and commence a life of piracy, eventually becoming the captain of a group known as the Fallen Monk Pirates. And you can tell that Arouge is the captain because his smiley face adorns the Jolly Roger of the cohort. In regards to the other members of the Fallen Monk Pirates, at the moment they are portrayed pretty much as auxiliary background figures. However, they do all resemble something of an order as they wear the same robes as their captain. And while it is unlikely, it's also entirely possible that at least some of these individuals are also former Sky citizens and are simply hiding their wings within their robes for the sake of being inconspicuous on the Blue Sea. Although with that said, Arouge doesn't seem to care for hiding his heritage himself, so that thought might be a bit of a stretch. In any case, with his crew in tow, Arouge eventually entered the Grand Line and became a notorious pirate displaying a particularly rough and raw fighting style consisting of pure brawn, which you can see overtly in Arusha's weapon of choice, which is that he seems to enjoy lugging around a large hexagonal pillar to engage in heavily blunt forced focus battles. Although that is not to say that Arusha needs this item to fight. In fact, most of the evidence we've seen would say otherwise. If anything, this pillar is more of a neat utility item that Arusha makes use of from time to time, simply because he can. But with all of this in mind, Arusha became a near instantaneous terror on the seas, earning an initial bounty of 108 million berries by the time he had reached the halfway point, being Sabadi Archipelago. And despite only really scraping over the 100 million berry mark, this distinction would lead him to becoming one of the supernovas, a cohort of rookie pirates who had all arrived at Sabadi at roughly the same time, including protagonist of the series Monkey D. Luffy, as well as his right-hand man Rora Norozoro, as well as other grand contemporaries such as Trafalgalore and Eustace Kidd. And while yes, Arouge actually held the lowest bounty of the 11 supernovas, you would never be able to tell that simply by observing him alone, because Arouge exudes a profound found level of confidence, much of which probably comes from the whole permanent smiling thing. But during the Sabadi arc, he was shown to be willing to leap into combat at a moment's notice against any number of world figures, including his contemporary supernovas, a pacifista, and even a marine admiral. And as much as it's very, very easy to blame Luffy for all of this chaos on Sabadi, in truth, Arouge was starting his very own brand of anarchy long before the Straw Hat Captain punched a world noble in the face. As in the very first glimpse of Arouge we catch in the series, he is locked in combat with fellow supernova, Massacre Soldier Killer member of the Kid Pirates. Now, exactly why this altercation began is unknown, but the available evidence does point to Arouge being the party who started it. Bad, bad Arouge. As the crowd around them exclaim, the Mad Monk is going wild. As well as the fact that Killer, despite his epithet of Massacre Soldier, which is terrifying, but he is generally a calm, cautious, and collected man. In any case, the skirmish is brought to an abrupt halt by yet another supernova being Diaz Drake, who then told both combatants to save their rampage for the new world, which is all well and good, but that choice would not necessarily remain up to them, as after Luffy's even more reckless actions, Marine Admiral Kizaru was summoned to Sabadi, along with a small legion of pacifista, which you know is not good news, not good news at all. However, this is where we would get to see the Mad Monk's true power briefly displayed. 
And very intriguingly, Urush holds the power of a currently unnamed Devil Fruit that seemingly allows him to directly convert any physical damage he takes into an excess of strength for him to put to use. And the effect of this also manipulates his physicality, which was shown when his body exceeded the size of a pacifista, which is no easy task because those things are gigantic powerhouses. And the one attack we are aware of in this form is known as Inka Zarashi, which literally means karma exposure or karmic punishment according to the Viz Manga translation, which is essentially referring to Uru striking his enemy with the power granted to him via the damage of said enemy. So whoever his unfortunate opponent is, is receiving their karmic punishment, absorbing exactly what it is that they put out in the world to begin with. And with the power Uruj demonstrated after acquiring that strength, it more than likely would have been enough to defeat the cyborg. However, at this point, Marine Admiral Kizaru intervened and shot a laser beam through Uruj's shoulder, effectively eliminating him from this conflict. Although Uruj and the fallen monk pirates would find themselves able to escape this dire situation after Kizaru's attention was turned towards dealing with the Straw Hats, whom he ultimately also failed to apprehend. In fact, you know what, when you think about it, this was a uh, pretty poor showing from Kizaru, because as much as he was able to defeat any number of supernova he encountered with ease, he didn't manage to capture a single member of this 11 person wanted list. And I guarantee you, this is the sort of reason why he was not put forward to be the next fleet admiral. Back to Uruj though, and he goes on to make some scattered appearances during the rest of the Paramount War saga, generally by sitting pretty and watching the conflict of Marineford play out. Although at the conclusion of the event, he actually made a rather interesting observation in regards to a certain Blackbeard, where Uruj stated that he would be the key and the eye of the storm for some time to come. And I guess I point this out because Blackbeard tends to be a bit of an ignored presence in One Piece. I mean, not so much these days, but the fact that Uruj was more concerned with his presence and the other events that had taken place shows that he is a very tuned in individual. But after the Paramount War was said and done, Uruj and the Fallen Monk Pirates immediately set sail into the New World, following their log post to a curious location we now know as Raijin Island, an area of the world that is perpetually being struck by lightning. This did not stop the Fallen Monk Pirates though, as eventually they moved on from the island and began causing all sorts of havoc over the New World, and quite notably, eventually, Uruj would cease to be known as a supernova and instead labeled as a member of the Worst Generation, which is a group that encompasses all of the former supernova, although it adds the figure of Blackbeard to their cohort. However, Uruj's most notable action in the New World thus far has been an incredibly bold invasion of the territory of Charlotte Lin Lin, better known as Big Mom, who is one of the four emperors of the sea. And during this time, Uruj was met by one of her then four sweet commanders, Charlotte Snack, a man with a bounty of 600 million berries. However, despite the numerical difference between 600 and 108, Uruj emerged victorious, which shouldn't be all that surprising because remember boys and girls, we should never judge a character's strength or their general power based solely on bounty numbers. But this sweet victory would be short-lived as a second commander by the name of Charlotte Cracker then immediately pursued and defeated the Mad Monk, forcing the entire crew to flee to a Sky Island where they would lay in recovery for quite some time. And it would be here that Uruj encountered a most unexpected sight, being another of the Emperors of the Sea, Kaido. Although this time around, Uruj had no inclination to fight. And in fact, it's not clear whether or not Uruj recognized this man as Kaido to begin with. But even if he did, Kaido's purpose here was to jump off the Sky Island and give something of an attempt of suicide by meeting the hard ground 10,000 meters below. And this would actually lead to one of the rare moments in the series where we saw Uruj offering a facial expression that did not consist of a smile as he was determined not to stop Kaido and instead offered him a prayer, anticipating his death, which once again went on to display the more pious side of Uruj. Although Kaido, of course, did not die, and the group of the Worst Generation members that he nearly landed on were nowhere near as lucky as Uruj in encountering the Emperor. Yeah, that's probably an, an understatement. With Eustace Skid in particular being beaten to a pulp and being imprisoned on the island of Wano. So that's definitely one reason for Uruj to keep up that devious smile of his. But sadly, this is the last that we have seen of Uruj in the story at the time of this recording. In fact, his most recent appearance would have been in the film One Piece Stampede, where he, alongside most of the West Generation, attended the Pirates Expo in the hope of attaining Roger's treasure, which very notably was not the One Piece. And so Uruj became embroiled in those events and even briefly fought against Douglas Bullet, but that's about it really. Plus all of this is non-canon stuff, so we'll all just resume forgetting about it in three, two, one. Some more fun facts about Uruj. Many of Arusha's character elements are almost certainly based on the famous Russian Grigory Rasputin, a man who was labeled as the Mad Monk, despite holding no official position in the Russian church. He was, however, exceptionally charismatic, gaining an absurd amount of influence with the Tsar, and was even rumored to be having an affair with the Tsarina. Not an awful lot is known about Uruj's feelings towards his fellow Worst Generation members, although to be fair, not a lot is known about Uruj's feelings towards anything. However, he does possess a certain level of respect for both Luffy and Zoro. Zoro because he was willing to stand up to one of the world nobles during the Sabadi arc, and Luffy because he was a man capable of commanding the beast that is Zoro. 
While Urusha's conflict with Snack was only briefly mentioned in the manga, the anime adaptation did elect to visually depict a part of it, showing Urusha emerging victoriously before going on to be brutally beaten by Cracker. While the Rouge's 108 million berry bounty may seem quite small compared to his fellow Worst Generation members, it does carry some significance, as the number 108 is seen as a mystical number in Eastern religion, with Japanese Buddhists in particular believing that a man must conquer 108 temptations before reaching Nirvana. And this number can also be seen elsewhere in the series, being used commonly, with Zoro's 108 pound cannon being yet another example. The flagship used by the Fallen Monk Pirates is known as the Hanjamaru, which, as with the rest of Arouge, takes aesthetic influence from Japanese folklore, particularly in regards to its white moony figurehead. As a member of the worst generation, Arush has been subject to a wide variety of requests, including having him drawn as a woman, as well as a quote unquote cute person, both of which still have this eerily familiar air of overwhelming power that Arush tends to exude even when he has an ever delightful bow in his hair. And finally, a truly useless fact, according to Echiro Oda in an SBS segment, if Arush was not a pirate, then his career of choice would be as a cabaret club manager, which is a, uh, okay, well, it's quite a departure from what we know of him. I would have said cabaret club bouncer myself, but look, Rouge has larger ambitions than that, and I think that we should all come to respect that. And that pretty much does it for Arouge. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.